Well, how's everybody feeling? Good? Wait till I'm through with you. <laughs> Actually, it's a pretty serious conference. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to uh, really uh, zero in on many of these meetings, but the ones that I have seen are very serious. And so does anybody object if we start with a joke to lighten things up a bit? <laughs> okay, good. Actually, I hadn't planned to do that, but I was uh, uh, in the restroom, get, you know, washing my hands and combing my two or three hairs, and uh, somebody pushed the button on the little uh, machine that puts out all that hot air, you know, and I went whoosh. And it made me think of some jokes. <laughs> and like uh, during the campaign, uh, a lot of the uh, men's room uh, uh, air blowers had these little, uh, little signs above the button that says, push for a political announcement from President Obama. <laughs> and uh, then the other one, I was thinking about the uh, story. It goes something like this. I'm supposed to say, you know, I met the most interesting person in the lobby and he was uh, from a little tiny kingdom called Hunza, and he talked strange. He said to me, ooh, 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 are you Mr. Griffin? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, ooh, 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 I've read your book, and so forth. It goes on like that. You know. Finally, I'm supposed to say, what uh, country do you come from? He said, ooh, 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 Hunza. Hunza, that's a little remote country over near northwest Pakistan, isn't it? Ooh, ooh, yes, it is. And I'm supposed to say, well, where did you learn your English? And he's supposed to say, ooh, shortwave radio. <laughs> you see the inspirations you can get in the men's room. <laughs> So now to the real topic. Now the other interesting thing is that um, right off the bat you were given some misinformation. When uh, I was introduced you were told I was going to speak on the Federal Reserve System and on um, financial matters and uh, I don't know whether this would be a disappointment or a relief but that's not my topic today. Um, actually uh, when I came here this morning and showed up and I was all prepared for a, a very a serious topic. I was up the, the other night, spent hours and hours preparing a speech. I had all my notes ready and I was ready to go. And I thought, boy, this is about a, a two hour speech. I wonder how much time I have. And uh, so I got here this morning and I, I asked the sponsor, I said, how much time do I have? And uh, she said, oh, about 45 minutes. I said, well, I hope I can squeeze a two-hour speech down into that. And she laughed. Everybody laughed except me because I knew that was really the truth. And then, then I got to looking at the program. And then I realized that we had some speakers here prior to my appearance that have already covered the general topic that I had intended to cover, which was the New World Order and things relating to that. And I thought, well, I'm just be, I'll just be covering new material. So, make a long story short, I decided to change the topic, and about an hour ago, up in my room, I just dashed out, the whole thing is here, so it's not so intimidating as that stack of cards that I had. So instead of boring you with a long, prepared speech, I'm going to bore you with a short, unprepared speech. <laughs> so, and the new title of my presentation is Thoughts About the Meaning of the Errors of Russia. Now, there are two approaches to this topic. I realized after looking at the literature that you could approach that topic from a theological perspective or from an ideological perspective. Well, I'm certainly not qualified to do the first. You have plenty of speakers here who are quite capable to do that. But the second area is more my category. I've spent probably the last 50 years of my life which is almost, uh, you know, my life is at this age. I, heck, I'm almost halfway through it, you know? <laughs> but I spent about 50 years of my life uh, paddling around in the subject of, or the topic of ideologies. And uh, so I feel like uh, maybe this is something I can contribute, and so that's my topic today. Thoughts on the meaning of the errors of Russia. And it will be from an ideological perspective only. Now, when I reviewed the literature on the message of Fatima, it became clear to me that there's a consensus among the experts 
that the errors of Russia basically is defined as communism or Bolshevik, Bolshevism, with emphasis on a component of that ideology, which is atheism or rejection of all spiritual values. And uh, that's perfectly good. I think that is a good starting point. And, uh, but we come head uh, up against the question or the word communism. And it begs the question, what is communism? Now, I've given a lot of thought to that question over the years because I think I've read just about all of those tomes, those books written by the great uh, writers on behalf of communism, Lenin, Stalin, Marx, Mao Zedong. I've got a library full of these things. Um, in fact, when my kids were growing up, I had to make sure that they understood that because I had these books in my library did not mean that I was an advocate of the philosophies in those books. So I had to explain, this is the good guy's shelf, and this is the bad guy's shelf. Now, here, well, I have a lot of books in the bad guy's shelf, and I, a lot of them were from people who thought that communism was the, the best uh, social uh, uh, ideology that you could have. And some of them who disagreed, they thought maybe fascism or Nazism was the best. And so I have a lot of books written from that perspective as well. And over the years, without any intention of doing so, I amassed quite a library written by a lot of bad guys that we would call bad guys, at least in this part of the world. Uh, there are parts of the world, of course, when they're still, where these people still are revered. But we, um, we think of them as the bad guys because we, uh, we've never had those regimes in our countries, or we didn't think we did anyway. And in studying that literature, I began to be aware that there were certain commonalities to them all, and that we were really talking about something deeper than those words, communism, fascism, Nazism, socialism, liberalism, whatever you want to call it. And I realized that we're kind of living in a world that's like the Tower of Babel. We use these words and people get into fierce arguments and disagreements over the meanings of those words because they don't agree on the meanings. You've got this uh, dichotomy of communists versus uh, fascists, and they fight wars, don't they? You think they're on the opposite side. But when you examine communism and fascism or Nazism, you think, not an awful lot of difference between those two. And you get big arguments between capitalists, so-called, and socialists, so-called, and liberals and conservatives and Democrats and Republicans and, and all of these words are fl fl flying around and nobody really can define what they mean. They have an emotional understanding of them. But when you ask them to define the word, it seldom agrees with the dictionary definition. And even if it does, it, it doesn't have any depth to it. People respond emotionally depending on how they feel about it. Is it good or is it bad? and yet they can't really define it. And for there is a very good reason, is because there's no difference in essence between most of these apparently opposing points of view. And I'm gonna talk about that today. I discovered that in examining all of these philosophies and written by all these bad guys that wrote all those books that fill up that bottom shelf in my garage or library, I found that there were certain commonalities, and I've identified six of them, which there are more, but I think the six are probably the dominant ones, and if we understand even two of the six, we're pretty well on the road to mastering this topic. So as time permits today, I'd like to discuss these, uh, these concepts. And I'll just mention what they are before I get to them. First, the first one involves the origin of rights, the origin of human rights. Where do they come from? And you will find two camps on one side and on the other. And these camps are, the word is collectivism. Collectivism is the word, ladies and gentlemen. Communism is a variant of collectivism. Fascism is a variant of collectivism. 
Nazism, a variant, and all of these isms, if you really look at them, they're all the same, the same substance underneath. If you peel off the label and you ignore the design of the uniforms worn by the military of those regimes, and if you ignore the uh, design of the nationalistic flags that are flown over the capitals of those regimes, and you get down to the hard core of what they believe, you'll find that they believe exactly the same. And so I mentioned one of them all right, which is already, which is the origin of human rights. The second one is the issue of group supremacy. The third one is the issue of coercion versus freedom in attempting to bring about reform. The fourth one is the issue of equality versus inequality. Is that good or bad? The fifth one is the role of private property. And the sixth one is the proper role of the state. So as time permits, let's plunge right into these, and I hope I don't bore you too much with them. To me, they're fascinating topics because they make you think, and they also have a profound impact on what kind of a world we're going to live in or what kind of a world we're going to leave for our children and our grandchildren. Now, I might add that collectivism, as we'll discuss shortly, has become the official ideology of the world. It's embodied in the official documents of the United Nations today, but we're going to come to that at the end of this. So let's start with the very first of these six issues, which is the origin of rights. Now, the individualist, and I categorize myself as an individualist as opposed to a collectivist, the individualist believes that human rights are ingrained with the individual. They come with the individual. Some would say they are God-given rights because we are born with them. It's the difference between being hardwired or softwired. They're not added to us. They're part of us. The difference between hardware and software. So the individualist believes that human rights are intrinsic to the human being. The collectivist, on the other hand, believes that they are granted by the state. You don't have rights. You're given rights by the state, and you should be grateful for them. Now, there's an important difference there. And if you read the, the documents of all of these totalitarian systems of the world, including the United Nations Draft Covenant on Human Rights, it's said in plain English in the, the, the UN Covenant document says, for example, in the exercise of these rights granted by the state, and that's a direct quote, and on and on and on. And they list all these wonderful rights that you have, rights of freedom of speech and uh, you know, freedom of assembly and uh, right to a job, right to health care, right to travel, right to form into a trade union, all of these rights. Oh, it just sounds wonderful. But when you read those documents, you'll find that there's a gimmick in all of them. First time I became aware of this is when I was reading the Soviet Constitution. It reads wonderfully well, by the way. You ought to go down to your local communist bookstore and get a copy of the, the Constitution of the former Soviet Union if you want to really read something that sounds wonderful, because all these rights are listed. But you'll notice that in every one of them it says, uh, you're granted this right, for example, the citizen is granted the right to freedom of speech, absolutely, except, except what, except what, except as may be determined by law. Every one of them has that, except as granted by law, except as defined by law. In other words, you've got these rights until they pass a law and take it away from you. How simple can you get? But people don't see that. If you would read these documents with half as much care as you would read a used car sales contract, you wouldn't sign them. And yet millions, if not billions, of people around the world have signed on to these contracts, except as may be provided for by law. Now, how different that is from the, the US Constitution, forgive me 
Here I am outside the United States talking about the United States Constitution, but that's the one I know most about. But I thought it was a, a brilliant document because in the Bill of Rights, it says Congress shall pass no law respecting the right of uh, freedom of speech, religion, assembly, right to bear arms, and so forth. Not except as may be provided for by law, but no law, get it? In other words, it's like that parking sign, I love it, uh, down near the cleaners, near my, in my little town, it says, don't park here, don't park here, and don't even think about parking there either, you know, it says, no, no parking. <laughs> no law, and that's a difference. So that's the difference, one of the differences between individualism and collectivism, and that is that the rights do come with the individual. They're either God-given, or however you want to describe them, they're ingrained, they're, they're hardwired with the individual. Whereas all collectivist ideologies believe that rights are granted by the state. Now you see the bottom line there, I know you've already understood this three times at least, but if the state can grant you your rights, then they have every right to take them away as well. And if you think about that, you, everybody would say, I am an individualist on this issue, okay. That was certainly an error of Russia, because they had adopted that principle in Russia, in the Soviet Union, that rights were granted by the state. So now we move to the second one. This is perhaps the most profound of them all, maybe the platform of them all. The collectivist believes that the group is more important than the individual that the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. How many times have we heard that? I was taught that in school. I thought it made sense. I mean, after all, it's just uh, like democracy, isn't it? The greater good for the greater number, the majority rules, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that sounded like a great principle until I began to think about it and began to run across some literature by a lot of wise people that lived years and years ago and talked about this sort of thing, literature that I was not exposed to in school. First of all, let's, let's challenge that idea. What about the group? What is the group? Can you point to a group? Have you ever seen a group? No? You haven't. You've seen individuals, a lot of them. But this thing called group doesn't exist. It's a concept in the mind. It's an abstraction. It's a mathematical concept. It represents more than one person, but itself, it doesn't exist as a real thing. It's an abstraction. You cannot see a group. You can only see individuals. You cannot see a forest. You can only see trees. Only trees are real. Only individuals are real. The rest is an abstraction. It's a mathematical concept of the mind. And when you start to say that this abstraction that doesn't really exist has rights that are superior to the rights of individuals who do really exist, you've made a terrible, terrible mistake. Because you set in motion an ideology which allows the rulers or the, the demagogues, the leaders of this imaginary group, to stand up and say, I speak on behalf of the group. I will tell you what is best for society. I speak for the people. And now you're on that slippery slope of the people this and the people that, and we represent the people when in fact it's an oligarchy always of one or two or small group of people that rule the whole regime in the name of the group. And every atrocity that you can imagine throughout history has been committed in the name of the greater good of the greater number. Most of the wars of history and many of the atrocities of our current day are being justified in the name of this is good for society, or it's good for our nation, or if we don't do this now, we're, you know, whatever the argument is, it's that we must sacrifice individuals in order to provide a greater benefit, benefit for a greater number of people. Now, 
it's hard to get over that. It was for me because I had lived with that concept for so long as a young man. And I thought, wait a minute, there's got to be something wrong, something wrong here. And then I began to think, oh, this, no, I was tricked. For example, this idea of democracy, you know, the rule of the majority, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It brings us to the question of the difference between a republic and a democracy. I know that's a phrase that you probably have heard many times of people in this audience anyway. There have been books written on it and pamphlets written on it, speeches given on it and so forth. But still, people, what's the difference between a republic and a democracy? Now, we're talking about the classic definition of the word republic. Not today, it doesn't mean anything today. I mean, we've got the Republic of China, every dictatorship in the world calls itself a republic today. But classically, when the issue was brought up in the creation of the United States Constitution, and I'm back to that, the founding fathers of America had long discussions and they exchanged letters and gave speeches about it. And they said, we do not want this country to be a democracy. That's the last thing we want. They said the democracy is the worst form of government imaginable because it always destroys itself. It feeds upon itself. It creates mob rule. And it just works so long as the majority can plunder the minority until finally everybody's plundering everybody else and then it collapses and always goes into a form of dictatorship. And they said that over and over and over again. And they looked to history for examples and they were right. They don't teach that in school now. I, in fact, they didn't teach it when I was going through, which was 3,000 years ago. And they had already forgotten it then. But it's a fact. So what is this difference between a republic and a democracy? Well, majority rule. Is that a good idea under all circumstances? Notice the phrase, all circumstances. <clears throat> what about a lynch mob? There's only one dissenting vote, and he's at the end of the rope. That's majority rule, is it not? Oh, wait a minute. That, yeah, that is. That's majority rule, but that's not such a good idea either. Why not? It's because individuals have rights. Even individual of one against the group has a right to a fair trial at least. And so the difference between a republic in the classical definition and a democracy is the democracy is majority rule, end of discussion. As long as you can get 51% of the vote, then you can do anything you want to do to the other 49%. Too bad about you guys, but you lost. <laughs> We're winners. That's the kind of world we live in today, democracy. We do have democracies today. They didn't start out as democracies, but that's what they have become. But a republic says, no, you can't do that. The majority cannot deny the rights of the minority, even a minority of one against 100 million. Mathematics has nothing to do with it. It's the principle of the individual. You see, we're back to individualism versus collectivism. It's the principle of the, of the supremacy of the individual. We have rights that are ingrained in us. And I don't care how many other people there are that want to take our rights away. They may, may be able to do so because they have all the numbers, but they don't have the right to do so. And so if we're putting together the kind of a philosophical program that we want the future to live by, we want our children and grandchildren to live by and within, we better be very clear on the idea that the individual is the cornerstone of society and not the group. Because the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the governments should be to protect the rights of the individual. And if you remember, right in the, in the uh, preamble of the Declaration of Independence for the United States, it says it is the function of the state to protect the rights of the individual. Not to grant them, but to protect the rights of the individual. Very important concept. And this is perhaps the most fundamental of all of the dividing lines between the individualist and the collectivists. Let's move on. I could talk and would like to talk more about all of these, but time does not permit. Here's a very important one, coercion versus freedom. 
You can always spot a collectivist mind because uh, I have a very good friend, by the way. He, he denies that he's a collectivist, but boy, is he ever. If, if he sees something he doesn't like, if somebody throws a cigarette on the ground, you say, there ought to be a law. <laughs> you know people like that. Maybe there are some here. I don't know. I kind of used to be that way myself before I thought it through. Ought to be a law. Put these people in jail that messed up that ground. Here. Everything we don't like, there ought to be a law. We want to force people to do what they should do. We don't want to give them freedom of choice, you know. Why not? Because they might not do what we think they should do. And we're smarter than they. We're wiser than they are. We're better than they. We should rule. We should make the rules. And they should follow them. See, Kyle? <laughs> that's the mentality. They will do it right, you see. That's the, that's the uh, characteristic of collectivism, one of them that is present in all of these regimes. And they don't want to give people freedom of choice. Now, seatbelts are a good example. I mean, we all know that seatbelts are a good idea. The collectivist says, you've got to wear seatbelts. You should wear seatbelts because if you're in an accident, it could save your life. So seatbelts are a good idea. Therefore, we'll pass a law. And if you don't wear seatbelts, you dummy, we're going to put you in jail. Individualists say, seatbelts are a good idea. I agree with that. People should wear them. Because if you're in an accident, you might get hurt without them. But we don't believe in forcing people to wear them. We believe in encouraging them. We, we believe in, especially, in showing by our own good example what should be done. But we don't believe in using coercion, using law as an instrument of coercion to force people to do what we think they should do. Now that is a very common element of all collectivist regimes and certainly it was present in the Soviet Union, still present there by the way, but it's probably more dominant in the Western world than we care to think. I was at a conference a couple of years ago and I walked out and I was stunned by this sign that was there right in front of the hotel. It says, uh, I think it was $200 fine, there's no parking, or I got it right, it's uh, handicapped only, $200 fine. $200 fine. Now, who wouldn't leave the space open for a handicapped person? And I, I took a picture of it, and on my website, I used my Photoshop, and I took out the $200 sign, and I put in, thank you. And then I put them side by side and said, Which would you, what kind of a community would you like to live in? The one that's going to force you to leave the parking open for somebody, which you would gladly do under most conditions, or one that's going to charge you $200 if you don't do it. You see, this is the mentality that has crept into our society all around the world. And it's a common element of collectivism. Collectivists do not believe in freedom, really. They don't believe that freedom works. They don't think you can have a, a, a good society without compelling people under force of law, punishment, fines, imprisonment, and if necessary, execution, to make people do what they are supposed to do. The fourth element, equality versus inequality. Well, individualists believe that the law should treat everyone equally. Everybody gives service, lip service, to that concept, don't they? Yeah, the law should apply to everyone equally. Do you know how many laws we have on the books that do not apply to everyone equally? Well, I don't either, but uh, I'm going to guess from my survey, probably about 95% of them do not apply to everyone equally. There are exceptions. Take the uh, tax laws, for example. Does everybody pay the same amount of tax? Heck no. It depends on your income bracket, your age, how many children you have, how much political influence you have, what part of the world you live in, da, da, I mean, what part of the... Uh, the country you live in, how many exemptions you have, do you have any independence, uh, if you have any uh, strong contacts in Washington, maybe you got a little bill passed that gives you a loophole, and that's the whole reason for those, how many books do they have, IRS rules, regulations, and laws, I guess they fill a whole room, nobody's ever read them all, every one of those pages is filled with exceptions to make sure that the law is applied unequally. 
that the whole purpose of the income tax is to make it unequal. And the logic behind it, of course, by the collectivist is that, yes, we deliberately make it unequal so that we can equalize the unfair conditions in society. So we're trying to overcome what we consider to be a, uh, 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 an unpleasant or unacceptable social condition by creating another unpleasant social condition. <laughs> we're going to level it out, you see. The collectivist mind is like a, a social engineer. They want to fix everything, and they're going to use coercion, they're going to use law, they're going to use taxes to make everything right. And in the process, they make everything wrong. It's not because, just because, they're not smart enough to figure out how to do everything right, but because once you give people that power, it becomes a magnet, that power becomes a magnet for the predator class. People figure out that if you give them the power to tax some, take money from some people and give it to others, then they start getting uh, a lot of people knocking on their door making deals or offering deals. If you'll pass this law that favors me at the expense of everybody else, I'll make a nice donation to your campaign. And so it attracts the predator class and it corrupts even the finest people. Whenever you create a government which has that power, you are creating a government which eventually will become corrupted. No exceptions possible. And that's how it works. Equality is the essence of individualism, but in the law, inequality is the essence of collectivism. And they certainly had a lot of that in the Soviet Union. That was certainly an error of Russia and certainly a big error of the rest of the world today. Move on, the role of private property. A lot can be said about that, but it all boils down to one thing. Private property is the only thing that allows an individual to be independent. And if an individual is not independent, then he's dependent. And if he's dependent, then who's he going to be dependent upon? Well, if all other individuals are, in de are also dependent, then the only thing left for the individual to be dependent upon is the state. So that translates out to the fact that if you deny private property to individuals, then you are guaranteeing that these individuals will be dependent upon the state for everything. They'll be dependent for their livelihood, for their food, their shelter, their clothing, their education, health care, everything. And when you are dependent upon the state for everything or even a lot of things, you cannot participate in self-government. You are, in essence, you are the servant of the state. Now, it's sometimes you could, you could take probably a whole day discussing all the ramifications of that, but that's the basic formula. Without the right to private property, you are the servant of the state. And that is why in every single collectivist regime in the world, they are the enemies of private property, because they know that that must be eliminated so that people will become subservient to the state and not have the ability to resist it. Sort of a, a sub-factor on this, this is not on my list, but since we are at a conference where the uh, theological theme is so strong, I feel compelled to mention that there is another element here. Uh, and that is that all collectivist regimes consider religions to be the enemy. It doesn't make any difference what religion it is, you'll find that they, they uh, attack or try and prohibit and destroy all religions. When the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia, they not only attacked the Christians, but they tried to destroy the religions of the, the Jews and the Muslims and anybody else. Because, it's not just because they were atheists, but they recognized that when people have a loyalty and to something else other than the state, if they turn to something outside of the state for moral values and for answers to the big questions of life, then they tend to be independent of the state. Impossible for these people. They want the state to become the new religion. They want people to worship the state. They want the state to become the arbiters of the new morality. 
They want people to judge their actions as good or bad in direct proportion to the degree to which they serve the state. So this is always another element of collectivism, which you'll find without exception throughout the world. It's not on my list, but it certainly is important, especially at this conference here today. And then finally, we turn to number six, which is the proper function or the proper role of the state. Collectivists believe that the state should be the affirmative action, the leader. The state should provide. It should uh, provide examples. It should teach. It should be the moral and commercial leader of society. It should solve all problems. And therefore, people should follow that. The state should make sure that you're well fed, make sure you're educated, make sure you're happy, make sure everything is just hunky-dory for you and you're supposed to be grateful for it, in which case many people are. But the individualist believes that the function of the state is negative, not positive. It's defensive, not aggressive. That the whole purpose of the state, the only legitimate of the state, and let me stop there for a minute and do a subparagraph on that thought. What is the state? The state is the legitimate use of coercion. The state is that force which everyone by contract or agreement says, yes, you can use force for these reasons. You can use coercion. You can have laws. You can put people into prison. You can even execute them. The ultimate use of coercion. That's what the state is. And so now we, now we say the state, the proper function of the state, therefore, which means to use coercion of all these forms, is what? Anything you want? Is it to make sure that somebody has health care? You can go kill somebody because, because they're not going along with a health care program? Is that it? Can you put them in prison for life because they're not going along with a health care program? No. What is it that is the basis of the legitimate use of coercion. Collectivists believe there is no basis. It's anything the majority wants, the majority rules, anything. The individualist says very serious restrictions on this force, and they are negative. They are defensive. They are to protect the life, liberty, and property of its citizens, nothing more. That is the legitimate function of coercion. Negative. Yeah, we got a few individualists here. Isn't that wonderful? Kids don't think this through. I was never exposed to these concepts in school. I think that a, a grade school kid, if they came face to face with these principles, would have no trouble recognizing the correct answer, but they're not exposed to them. That's the thing. So perhaps the most, in the application of the law, the most important distinction is what is the use of that law or the, or the proper role of that law. And so I'll repeat, it's negative, it's defensive, it's to protect the life, liberty, and property of its citizens. Not to provide for them, not to make them happy, now you get into gray areas, and this is sort of a, another subparagraph of the main heading. You get into gray areas, unfortunately. Wouldn't it be nice if everything were black and white? Uh, unfortunately, that's sometimes the case, but in this case, it's not. Uh, because you get into an area like healthcare, for example. Now, do we have an obligation to protect the life of a person? Well, yes. Does that mean we should provide health care for them? One half of the brain says, well, yes, that's protecting their life, isn't it? The other half of the brain says, well, yeah, but not to the extent of forcing somebody else into, into involuntary servitude to provide that medical service. In other words, are we going to use coercion now against one class of people, those who have the ability to, to uh, offer medical care? We're going to force them to give it whether they want to or not, in order to save the life of another person. So we get into these areas where, oh boy, we got to go into a debate on this one, and sometimes yes and sometimes no. And so I believe, in my own mind, I, I struggled with this for a long time, and I believe I came up with a, a possible working solution with it. And that is in these gray areas, and there are some, there are many, when you're in doubt, 
as to which way to go, always err in the direction of less government. If you have any doubt, go in that direction and you'll be safe. So, now, those, those, that's a quick review of the six different points, and there are more. Another one that just pops into mind is that all collective society, societies have a great and glorious leader. Have you noticed? Yeah, they have a great and glorious leader, because it doesn't work so well unless you've got, you know, Big Brother. If those of you who have read 1984, remember the big poster, Big Brother, and the television screens, that he was the great and glorious leader. And all collectivist systems have the Mao Zedong, uh, Stalin, Obama. <laughs> oh, great and glorious leaders. Bush, I don't want to leave anybody out here. And, uh, and when you find the great and glorious leader, you, just, you ought to be very, very nervous because that means that the great and glorious leader is speaking on behalf of the group. He's speaking or attempting to speak on behalf of the nation or society. And he's telling you that you have to obey what he says because it's for the greater good of the greater number. And we're back to that one again. Collectivism in all of these six forms, and actually eight that I covered, has now become the official ideology at the United Nations. I know the United Nations has been discussed several times here at this conference by my good friends Jack McManus and Bill Jasper, I believe I saw their names on the program, very well qualified to talk about the United Nations and the development of this thing called the New World Order. And that's what it's all about. The New World Order is nothing more or less than world government based on the model of collectivism. That's what it really is. There's nothing inherently wrong with world government. You may find that surprising for me to say that. But world government is, is neither good nor bad. It depends on what kind of a world government. Nobody ever asks that question. See, if world government is so good, why didn't we just let Hitler finish the job? That's what he had in mind. But we didn't like his kind of world government, did we? So we need to ask that question today when they speak about world government and putting an end to all wars and, and solving all problems, you know, this aggressive uh, use of the state to solve all problems is built into the UN. We ought to ask, well, what kind of a system is it that they're building? And it's really, in substance, no different than the one advocated by Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or Vladimir Ilyich Lenin or any of the other good old boys. So that's officially part of the UN, and I think people need to know that, because right now I find that even those who are aware and of and concerned over the growing totalitarianism in their own regimes are not looking at the same thing that's growing, if not even ahead of the game, at the international, international level, at the United Nations. All those guys they are waiting for is to get the weapons to enforce their decrees. And that's what this deceptive phrase, disarmament, is all about. Disarmament is not disarmament. It's merely the transfer of armaments from national governments to the United Nations. They will have the weapons of mass destruction. It's not to get rid of the weapons of mass destruction, but just to make sure that they're all in the hands of the good old boys at the UN, so then nobody can escape. So we need to understand this about the UN and this idea of collectivism in all of these glorious forms is being pushed daily in the Western world, in North America for sure, in the United States and I know in Canada under the deceptive or mysterious title of Agenda 21. Anybody here heard about Agenda 21? Well, some. You need to all know about it. It's a, it's a code phrase. It's the title of the program for collectivism, global pro, uh, collectivism, which was designed at the United Nations and is being implemented as we speak in every country of the world, at least where the UN has an interest in implementing it, in the more advanced nations. And it's being done under the guise of environmentalism. 
They're using the label of let's be concerned about our planet Earth. Our planet Earth is, is being destroyed. We're losing our natural resources. Uh, everything is going bad in, in the environment. We've got global warming. We've got all these things. We've got pollution. So therefore, what we need is more laws. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> More laws, and especially at the na international level, to regulate and control these things and take away the personal freedoms that you and I have over our own property because we, we need to do it for the greater good of the greater number. We need to do it to save the world. And there's that argument, you know, the greater good of the greater number. To hack with your personal liberties and your freedoms, we're saving the world. That's all packaged under the heading of Agenda 21. If you don't know about it, learn about it quickly. And you need to be at every local town hall meeting, every county meeting. You've got to stand there and expose this Agenda 21 for exactly what it is, which is an assault against private property. And eventually, it is the cutting edge of bringing the total collectivist package into all of the nations of the world and it's being coordinated at the United Nations. Well, not too bad. <sighs> I can take a breath and reach to my conclusion now. My conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, is that the errors of Russia are the errors of collectivism. And indeed, they already have spread throughout the entire world. This is a very important topic, I believe, because if we wish to correct those errors, we had better be very clear as to what they really are. Because it makes no sense for us to pray for deliverance from them in the morning, and then in the afternoon go to the polls and vote for them. And that's my message. Those are my thoughts today on the errors of Russia, and thank you for listening.